And we are live. Welcome to episode 3224 of the Survival Podcast. It is Thursday, January the 5th, 2023. Still sounds weird to say it's 2023. Actually, I I think it still sounds weird that we ever said it was 2022 or 2021. It's kind of weird to live this far in the future from where I started out all the way back in the 1970s, right? Uh, old man now, and there will be some old man Jack stories in today's show. A lot of you guys like that. We're going to finish up our four-part series uh, today on the four pillars of homesteading. And uh, I would say for those of you that are permaculture enthusiasts, there is definitely a permaculture uh, theme within the concept of homesteading. But it, I've tried to make it more broad with this. Uh, my grandfather certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have considered himself a permaculturist. He wouldn't have known the word. Uh this is really just how a lot of America lived for a very long time. And the majority of Americans lived this way. In fact, it was the majority not so long ago, even long after uh, many people moved off the farms. So it was a time in America, not so long ago, a century ago, say, where the vast majority of people in America made their living either directly or indirectly from agriculture. And now, uh, you know, they call it non-farms payroll. I don't even know if we need to do that anymore because so few Americans relative to the total population are part of the agricultural community. But even when our, our granddads and great granddads went to the factories and the mines and uh, the stores and markets and became clerks and delivery men and kind of went off of, off of the farm, people still lived this way. I grew up this way. That's why I say the old man Jack stories will come into it. Because uh, I'll, I'll talk about growing up in the 80s in rural Pennsylvania quite a bit today, because I'm going to draw on that a great deal. And so we already covered, the first pillar was gardening. Uh, then we talked about uh, perennials and herbs. Actually, no, we talked about, what did we do second? We went to backyard livestock second. Then we went to perennials and herbs and kind of the backyard on your own property kind of forage your mindset. Today, we're jumping out into the world of foraging off your property, hunting off your property, fishing off your property. But I decided to do something right when um, I, I set this, this whole series up and I thought, you know, hunter-gatherer mindset has to be part of this. And, and I'll explain why when we get into the main topic today. Um, but as I thought about it, I'm like, that was so entwined with local community, with trade and barter, with realizing that other people had resources you didn't or could do things you didn't want to do. Where I grew up, we really didn't call any kind of company to do most things if you needed something done that you couldn't do you knew somebody or you knew somebody that knew somebody that could do it we did a lot of diy it was very seldom that you took your car to a mechanic especially if you're, you're a young broke teenager with your first jalopy car but you might know somebody that has a shop or maybe you, you needed something done that you couldn't do and you needed it done by a shop but you know, you were broke and young and somebody knew a guy like Andy Slifko in my case and said, hey, he's a good kid. Can you cut him a break on the cost? Uh, or maybe it was just in, in my case that I'm thinking of in particular, it was I absolutely could not get a bolt free on an exhaust system on a 1975 Grand Prix LJ. And it needed it needed to go up on a lift and it needed to be heated up with a torch to, got, to be gotten loose. But that's all I needed. I didn't need the work actually done. And uh, Andy, who was probably my dad's best friend, who ran a shop, was like, bring it by after hours. I'll take care of it for you. And he turned the nut about a half turn and said, it'll stay on you. You'll get home and you'll be able to do it now. And there were so many things like that. that to me, even though hunting a deer or catching fish or picking berries seems a little bit divorced from what I'm talking about here. It really isn't because it was so much more broad than that. Because what you might do, for instance, one thing that I needed done for me one time that also involved uh, Andy Slifko and was a, uh, a transmission issue that I had with, a, with the same vehicle and something I just really couldn't do. 
uh, myself because I didn't have the equipment to do it myself without it being really hard. And it was winter time and laying under jack stands with no garage sucks trying to do a, 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 a turbo a TH 400 turbo transmission out of a Grand Prix. He said, if you, if you just show me where you catch the wild brook trout, I'll do it for you. I'll do the whole thing for you. And he did. So the way those things tied into each other, to me, puts all this in one place. And it'll make even more sense when I give you my intro. Before we do that, though, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day number one today is Start9 Embassy Servers. Take back your digital sovereignty. They have two options for you, the Embassy One 469, the Embassy Pro 1699. Which one do you need? Well, you need at least the Embassy One if you want to take your digital sovereignty back. If you want to kind of do it for yourself and your immediate family and what have you like that, that's all you need. If you want to kind of have a little more horsepower, operate as like your own little service provider to your own little community or something like that, you probably want to step up to the Embassy Pro. Either way, if you're going to get one, become an MSB member first. You'll get 9% off anything you purchase at Start9. Remember, for those who use the Fold card, if you buy a Start9 gift card through Fold, you can start save another 9%. That's 18% right there. You can see how fast doing those things will uh, add up to some real money and help pay for your membership if you want to be a membership in my program. Uh, the Embassy Pro, though, obviously. And I have my Embassy Pro. It's for those on the thing. Here it is. It's, it's still in the box. Um, I, Matt's going to get somebody to walk me through and try to do some support videos for you guys to learn all the things you can do with start nine embassy servers. But guys, I'm excited about this. I am so happy to have those guys as a partner. I really want you to consider doing this for yourself. It's like giving yourself the gift of digital freedom. So definitely check out start nine. Next up, we're going to talk about homesteading today. But part of being a good homesteader is building your wealth. That's part of why we homestead. Because to me, well, I'll put it this way. Back in 2008, I had like a couple dozen podcasts under my belt at the most. And I did a show called From Home to Homestead. And I talked about how for most Americans, their home is actually a liability. It's an expense. They barely can afford it. If they lost a job within two or three months, they're in danger of being foreclosed on. And their home doesn't really produce anything. It's a place they sleep at night. They spend most of their time outside of it. And by changing our home to something that produces for us, we create a homestead like our great-grandparents did. But our grandparents understood about managing money. And John Pugliano is one of the best investment managers I've ever met in my life. And he has a podcast called The Wealth Steading Podcast. He's also a prepper like us. He's a ham radio operator. He's got the food storage. He's got it all. He's got like minimalist camping stuff, super light trailer, does his stuff out in the middle of the desert sometimes for the hell of it. He's a great dude, former United States Marine, really loved the guy, member of our expert council. And he gives his advice away for free on the Wealth Steading uh, uh, podcast. So definitely uh, check that out if you haven't already done so. And remember, John is on Fountain. So show him some sats love on Fountain if you listen to his show. I, I think if you listen to anybody's podcast, and they're on the Fountain app. You should listen to them on Fountain and throw them some sats. Guys, do you understand? Like, if you throw somebody like 5,000 sats, it sounds like a big deal. But it's a buck. It's literally a dollar. You know, throw your favorite uh, podcaster some sats once in a while. It's totally worth doing. Value for value exchange. Learn all about it at Fountain.fm. All right. So, with that, let's start off with kind of how I made this bridge in my mind. And why I made this bridge in my mind. Between hunting and gathering, also including an understanding of your community, right? Um, being able to actually utilize community resources and networking and, and, and things like that. And so what I decided, you know, like foraging and tr trade, as in trade and barter, really go together. And like I said, I'm going to tell you some stories today. But I had already made the decision to, to put these things together back in November when I did episode one of this four-part series. About a couple, about a week ago, someone popped up on me, we on chat and said, hey, I'm the guy that brought you some honey for MSB. Check out this interview. And I listened to the interview with this, this guy on YouTube. And he's talking about America before Columbus. And he mentioned this book called 1491, which is the Americas before Columbus. 
And I was like, I've been told about this book since it came out in like 04 or 05, and I've never read it. I probably should read it. So I went and got a copy, and I started reading it. And it really solidified what I have for my first four bullet points today, which is the, the foundation of human settlement, where we got there. I also am going to say I recommend this book highly. Um, I'll put a link in the notes today where you can find out more about it as well. Uh, but as I read it, I realized how little has changed in the world and how much like the rest of the world, the population of North and South America were before anybody from Europe got here. I won't get deep into that. I'm probably going to do a whole show on this topic in the future. But it also allowed me to see as these continuous rising and falling of civilizations, both grand civilization uh, like the Mexia or the Inca or the Aztec or what have you, or even the smaller groups that rose and fell and rose and fell, that there was a commonality of why humans bothered to get bigger than a tiny little tribe or village in the first place. That's how most humans have lived. Even in times that I would say were far, far more anarchist than they are today, people have tended to live in groups larger than a dozen people. And those are, first, they usually coalesce around a common ideology, whether it's spiritual or political. It doesn't really matter. There's some sort of common ideology that brings people together if it's not already there. Once a city gets to a certain size, people come, people go, you get a lot more diversity in that ideology. But that is, and I'm not saying good or bad. I'm saying this is what does it. The next is our subject today, or a big part of our subject today, which is hunting and gathering. So if you are going to, to, to be a hunter-gatherer, we have this classic image of this small group of people that just run around chasing the herds and all. But it's a much more effective strategy to have a base of operations and maybe hunting parties go out long term once in a while. But there's this larger group load share so that when you come back with baskets full of berries or a, a skid full of meat or something like that, there's there's a place to store it. There's, a, there's something to do with it. So you're not constantly having to work every day for that day's food. And if you think about it, the type of hunter gatherers that they've put in our head as being the classic hunter gatherer, without any kind of base of operations, even if it's a mobile base of operations, then you, you are kind of like at least every third day, you got to go out and get some more because you're out. You don't have the ability to really go long term with storage and kind of a reserve battery. And you damn sure can't get into cultivating crops or even the cultivation of wild crops where you're kind of doing a lot of forest agriculture, right? Uh, agroforestry, which is a big part of what not all Native Americans did, but many Native Americans did. Uh, the next is trade. People come together so that they can trade with others. Because if you stay in a small, very small number of people, the attraction to outside trade is actually relatively low. But as you build community, and I'm talking even you know a few hundred people that have kind of a base of operations, you have multiple skill sets, multiple sets of knowledge, you now have more to offer other groups. And therefore, you can begin to acquire things that your community can't produce. And the last, and it might be the most important, and it, this, this term is going to be the crux of my discussion on permaculture in a different way than we're going to talk about it today anyway, uh, at, in Bastrop, Texas. And I got an announcement that's pretty cool about that uh, we'll do at the end of the show, and that is security. And that's probably the primary initial reason. The, the hunting and gathering base of operations, the ability to conduct larger trade with outside groups, and the common ideology that brings an organization together is still kind of the devil's bargain. When you involve other people, then you have to like make accommodations for other people. The problem is if you don't do it, especially in, in times past, then a larger group just came by and took all your shit or enslaved you. And if, if you think slavery is an invention of the European powers or even the, 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 the European, Asian, African powers, you have no idea what life was like here. Like slavery was far more common in the world than it wasn't for the majority of human existence. And there's many forms of slavery. I would say today many people are slaves and don't know it. 
There's nothing better than have a slave that takes care of himself, houses himself, provides his own medication, provides his own food, still slaves to you. You know, like if they pay 50% of their income to you, you have a half slave that's fully self-sufficient versus a 100% slave that's 0% self-sufficient. You see how that works. So there's, there is this case that there's always been kind of this dynamic. And, and I wanted to start there because it kind of puts your mind in a different place than just being, hey, I know where I can go get a deer or I know where I can get some mushrooms because we're about to start talking about that. But think about it from the larger standpoint of who do you live next to? Who lives around you? How many people do you know where you live? Because this is the, if you want to know the thing that's made America the most vulnerable in the last 50 years, as much as I detest it, it's not jag, drag queens shaking their junky kids. That, that's awful. But that's, a, that's more a symptom than the disease, right? That's a symptom rather than a disease. It's like, and it's like an end stage of disease symptom, in my opinion, that we think this is okay. And, and it has nothing to do with drag queens or gay people or tra whatever, right? And I know, like, he's going political. Relax. I'm just going to make a point here. If somebody were, were just taking garden variety strippers, okay, and taking them into schools, just regular old women strippers from strip clubs, people would say this is not appropriate. Having it be a man dressed like a woman doesn't change. It's also, you can say it's worse or whatever, but it's still inappropriate. But where did that, where did this, we get so weak? Where did the patient that is our culture get so weak that this could even happen? We stopped talking to each other. We stopped having community like the, the type of community I'm, I'm talking about today. We stopped having a thing where if a kid screwed up on the other side of town, by the time he got home, his parents knew about it. Because the parent internet, before there was an internet internet, you know, one parent called, I, I don't know, here's what, he, oh, I know who that is, that's young Jack, I, I got it. And young Jack got home and was like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. And already knew, like, when you took that risk as a kid, you knew that they would probably find out if anybody saw you. That made us, for every time we got caught, right, especially as we got older, there was a hundred times we didn't, because we got smarter about it. We, we thought about our actions before we took them. And as we've ceased to be a society where kids have to do that, they, they photograph themselves doing stupid shit and they still don't get in trouble for it. And we stopped talking to each other. We stopped having these common kind of rally points in our community. Everything's fell to shit. So I'm talking about that as much today as I am talking about the core subject. But if we're going to be hunter gatherers, then we need to assess the resources around us and the resources around us to me, I'm breaking down today and I'm now I'm talking about actual hunter gathering. We're going to divide this in half. We're going to talk about classic hunter gatherer stuff adapted to our time and our, our place in the world. And then we're going to talk about barter and trade and community second. So those resources are direct forage things that don't run away and you don't have to kill them and you go get them and they go in your belly one way or another and and the most common ones for me were berries of, of like all types uh mushrooms and wild vegetables so let's talk about each of those a bit so the berries would be where i grew up it was blackberries wild strawberries and wild blueberries and the wild strawberries were so small and such a short season, they were more like you went out and you found some as a kid and you picked them and you ate them. If you brought any home at all, it was enough for grandma to make maybe one batch of muffins with. It was a treat once a year. They weren't huge supply. But the blueberries and the blackberries, good Lord, they were just everywhere for about a month each. First the blueberries came in, then the blackberries came in. And we actually used to organize like group picks. There was this one mountain we used to go up on. I think the coal company owned it, but anybody that wanted to could go there. Nobody was going to do nothing about it. We had one cop for the entire township, and he probably would have blasted the bottom of his car out trying to get up there if he went up there with a car instead of a lifted truck or a Jeep or something like that. And we'd have 50 people on this pole line. 
and the blueberries would just go nuts up there. One thing about mining country is a lot of the soil ends up very acidic, and if it hasn't been damaged bad enough to truly be polluted, blueberries like that. So you have pines come back in as well on the, on the edges of a pole line that's kept clear by the power company, so that's more acid. And then the way this pole line kind of went up to the top of the mountain, it kind of had to sag on the ridge port, went back down. And because of that, great irrigation, there was shade at different times of day in different places. So you had kind of a good early spring moss underlay and the blueberries were just fat up there. And we'd have 50, 60 people up there picking blueberries for several hours. And then we'd have people in different stages. And this is where community comes in. Like, yeah, you can go pick blueberries by yourself. It's not a hell of a lot of fun. You're going to eat most of them and you don't end up with as much. By pooling resources, and we just had like old, uh, somebody lifted them probably. I don't even remember whose they were, but one of our group had like the trays like you get at a lunch in school. And so then we would just, as we come in, we dump them and some people would sit there and sift and any of the red ones or under under ripe ones that didn't uh, quite be worth keeping they'd pick them out and keep putting them in to bags and then we would just say how many families are there and this is how many we got we divide them up against the families and it was an incredibly community building thing but it also would put like no one grew a blueberry in their backyard if you were part of that community mix it wasn't that you didn't appreciate the fact that you could grow a blueberry it's that the amount of real estate you had to grow things was fundamentally limited. So since this thing did it for itself, we used that real estate to produce something else. And we did the same thing with blackberries, but I think the blueberries were just more popular in the community. The other big one was mushrooms. And this was great because there was some spring mushroom foraging, but the mushrooms were much better foraging from about the end of August into October. That was really mushroom season. And I remember being this poor ass kid from the coal region. And we really were a poor family. I didn't know how poor we were because we were a little less poor than most of the people that I went to school with. And a whole lot more poor than the three rich families in the whole damn county. And we used to eat mushrooms all the time. And we ate mataki, also known as head of the woods, morals or morels i'm sorry and chanterelles now i sit back today and i watch these cooking shows and like all these high-end falutin chefs competing with each other and shit and then the one chef's like oh he just reached for the chanterelles and the motakis that's amazing high-end gourmet we were eating these things weekly we would eat them freshly cooked we would eat them uh, we would we would dry some, we would freeze some. Every once in a while, we would bread and fry some. of. Never a moral would get bread and fry. Those were like the spongies we do. Chicken in the woods, we would do more like a fried mushroom. Uh, when I say fried again, I mean like a breadcrumb or a batter and deep fried. Uh, they were just amazing. And I really didn't appreciate the fact that I was eating a gourmet level product. I had no idea. It was just what we grew up with. And it was an amazing, you know, you're talking about a medicinal thing as well that was just part of our lives. And that's why I say it was very hunter-gatherer, right? It was very hunter-gatherer in, in, in the way that we were practicing it and the fact that it was actually nourishing us beyond just raw calories. And the last I said is uh, wild vegetables. So, the two big ones of those that I kind of put a different category from these other two were leeks, wild leeks uh, that we would we would get like the first thing in the spring. And then a little later, uh, fiddlehead ferns. There was a place called the Second Swamp. No one could explain why it was the Second Swamp. Maybe my great grandparents would have known that it passed away. Maybe they never told my grandparents. I don't know. Maybe there was a first swamp that got drained and leaving only the second swamp. One reason or another, up on Broad Mountain, there was a second swamp. And before all the trees really filled back in, it would just be a carpet of new ferns coming up. And we would go out, my grandfather, me and my uncle specifically, and we would gather those all, you know, like, 
a couple of days in a row, a couple of weeks in a row until they were gone for the year because they're only really good when they're still rolled up before they unfurl. And they taste like asparagus. And the old man used to say, same thing as with the blueberries. Why the hell would I grow me asparagus when I can come get these every year? And so, and then there was other things, miners, lettuce and stuff like that. But those were like the core for us. And my point with that more isn't go find those things. It's that there's something where you are. One of the big resources here that we never had in Pennsylvania, and you don't have to go to, you know, big parks or stands of public lands for it, is pecans. Pecans grow so well in Texas that if you drive around during pecan season long enough in Dallas-Fort Worth, especially like main roads but not quite highways, you'll find places where businesses, et cetera, have planted pecans along the easement so they're in public easement. No one really cares, and you'll see people pulled over picking up pecans, just picking them up off the ground. Think about what pecans cost, and think about the fact that you can do that, and even though you'll see people doing it, how few people right here actually do it, even now when food prices are through the roof. And if you start to think about the value of that direct forage in dollars, it starts to add up really quick. And every dollar that is foraged is a dollar that can be either saved or spent on something else. And that's, that's something that you really need to think about here because everything that I just said is more a dollar savings than a required to a requirement to acquire caloric savings. Not a huge amount of our calories came from this stuff. It was all more kind of a luxury. I mean, the mataki mushrooms, the hen of the woods, ram's head, call it what you want to. We had, the Spirico family had to low down on where to find these things. And we expanded that one year when I was, I was 14 years old and we were bow hunting, me and my uncle, my dad's younger brother. And we were out on this public land that anybody could hunt. And my uncle had a philosophy. And this is an important philosophy and we'll come back to it to remind you of it because it's so important. Most people who use public resources, public lands, et cetera, never step foot more than 10% of the available land. There's some path, paths and trails and stuff like that that they stick to and go a little bit off of. And they don't go much further than that. And so if you focus your efforts on finding resources, game trails, whatever it is, inside the 90%, you won't deal with the mob of morons and there'll be more for you to find. So that's what we did. And we were, we were specifically scouting an area to expand our bow hunting into. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's a ram's head. So we cut it and threw it in our pack. And we're like, wait a minute, there's another ram's head. There's another ram's head. And we were surrounded by them. And we would go there every year and we'd fill up half a freaking pickup truck. I'm serious with these mushrooms. These are high dollar expensive mushrooms even back then. And they would sell for about 10 bucks. So now we're going into trade, right? They would sell for about 10 bucks a pound on a bar top, especially if they didn't know you had a truck full of them. So we'd go into a bar, these little local bars, not much bigger, like three times the size of my office, which is like a, a 12 by 13 room. And put a few pounds of them up on the bar and my uncle had a little scale, and we would sell them right in the bar. Barkeeper didn't give a damn as long as you bought at least one beer before you left. And by the time I was 16, they'd serve me a beer in these bars. That's the kind of place we're talking about. And, and we'd make a few hundred bucks and go home and still have more than we could directly use and still give some away. And, and so you start thinking about how to stack that. But this didn't feed us calorically. What fed us calorically was hunting and fishing and aquatic resources. And, and that's one of the biggest reasons to do this. Now, it, John here is saying, same here in Mississippi, pecans are everywhere. Now, if you have a, a source like pecans or chestnuts, you're talking a calorie crop. Chestnuts more carbohydrate-based, pecan more a fat and protein-based, which I would prefer personally. But if you can find stuff like that, then you can actually gain a lot of caloric yield from foraging versus hunting or fishing. 
uh, I can't remember the Rob Greenfield in, in Florida. Like he was foraging these huge wild yams that some of them weighed 60 pounds. That's a, that's a caloric yield. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying traditionally we didn't, we lived a lot more like Northeastern American natives, right? Native Americans, uh, as far as our diet, because we relied so much on fish and hunting. So fishing, I break that down to fish, shellfish and aquatic vegetation. I'm not going to go deep into any of these, just real brief overview of them. So the show doesn't last three hours today or what have you. But I'll tell you that when I was a kid, aquatic vegetation was not a thing. I didn't know about it. Nobody I knew knew about it. Nobody I knew ate any of it. Like it, it just wasn't something you worried about. We did have a few creeks that were well up into the mountains and they were above where any mining had ever done where we did occasionally collect some, some freshwater shellfish. Not a lot, though, but there were some mussels from one particular place that were really great. And that was more me and my friends. We'd, we, we'd score some beers. We'd pack up our shit for the night. We'd go up and go over this mountain to a water dam that was for water for the county. And you weren't supposed to fish there. And there was a guard who had a little house but it was pretty far down from the dam and it what he didn't do his job real well. And if we waited till late enough before we did anything, cause you could be back there and they wouldn't know before we set up a fire or something like that, he never bothered us. And we would sneak down and fish the pond at night or the dam. It was big ass dam at night, but the Creek that ran, well, one of the tributaries that ran into the Creek that fed the dam had these mussels and we'd pick a shitload of those and throw them in the fire and eat them right out of the fire. So we did a little bit of that, but what we really did, what we really did, hey, hi all, is it Creek or Creek, Jack? Well, if you're in the right part of Pennsylvania, it's a Creek. It's not a Creek, it's a Creek. In fact, it's a stream, it's a brook, it's a Creek, it's a Creek, it's a river. And if you were from, from where I was from, you would know that I just gave them to you in order from the size up, right? It ain't a Creek until you need waders to walk across it, right? It's pretty big. It has fish in it, but you can walk across most of it without hip waders. It's a creek. When it gets a little bit bigger, it's a creek. Anyway, um, fishing was where we really brought the food home. And I've talked about this before, but I'd like my grandfather or my grandmother would be like, well, what are you going to do today? I'm going fishing. And they'd be like, well, you, you know, you need to, you, you, you need to, we need some chores done here around the house, but you go fish and you just best bring some stuff home. And kind of my go-to that I always knew I could bring home were good, big, hand-sized bluegills, which is one of the best, I don't care what anybody says, one of the best eating fish you will find. And then, you know, before I had a car or depended on an adult, to get really where I want to go, I would occasionally pick up some channel cats from one dam up the road. But most of the time it was just big, good sized bullhead cats, which are also one of the best eaten fish uh, that you'll ever eat. Again, I don't care what anybody says about it. And uh, so I would always make sure that when I went out, I would take a, like a big burlap sack with me because you could, you know, if you're riding a bike as a kid or something, you could fold it up and throw it in a backpack. And I would try to catch some of that stuff right away. So it wasn't like, hey, and I wouldn't get in trouble. And if you, if I came home and got skunked out occasionally, nobody said anything. But if you weren't consistently bringing stuff back, they started to question whether you were really fishing or off just drinking beer with your buddies in the woods. I, th I just figured I'd drink beer with my buddies while we fished. And I had a lot of friends that really didn't keep fish either. So I'd take their fish. And once there was a few in that burlap sack, I might do some other stuff as far as fishing where I was less concerned about food, but I'd have to bring those fish home. I'd have to clean those fish. And if they weren't getting eaten tonight, and usually they weren't, I'd package them, put them in the freezer, label them all that. And it might be, you know, a half a dozen bluegills and two bullheads today, but over a summer, you know, only so much of it would get eaten over the summer. And when we got into fall, fishing went away and hunting took over. And we'd start drawing on the fish battery as we were putting up the venison and the squirrel and the rabbits and the pheasants and, and the dove and all of that. 
And it was just this constant rotational cycle. And I'm telling you, if you're thinking, I can't do that where I am, you, you probably need to look another a little harder. And you again, you might have to adjust. Uh, Small Creek Homestead said frogs and turtles are good eating. Totally agree. We didn't get a lot of frogs. The one place we could get frogs was a state park. And you like there was a consistent amount of large bullfrogs. The north is different than the south when it comes to this. There's bullfrogs everywhere down here. And but what we would do is we'd go fishing at night. And if there were a lot of frogs, I'm just going to say that if you take a red uh, rooster tail spinner and you shine a light at a frog, but don't completely blind him and you bounce that in front of him, a lot of times he'll bite it. And if he bites it, you got this frog on a lightweight rod and he just might accidentally end up in a live well. I'm just saying. So we would do some of that, but we didn't have a lot of it. But if I grew up in if I grew up in Louisiana, especially southern Louisiana, I would have probably just talked to you a lot more about frogs and crawfish rather than freshwater mussels, bullheads, and channel cats. And, and even though there's a lot of those too. So you have to think about what it is that's available around you. We're going to talk about learning more about that for yourself here in a minute, too. And the last one was hunting. And I would say that hunting and fishing combined probably provided my family back in the day, and we didn't have a stated goal of this, at least 50 to 60% of our calories came from venison, squirrel, rabbit, rabbit, fish, doves. I'm just going to say that I wasn't always quite the law-abiding citizen I am today. And I'm sure that the... Uh, Statue of limitations is long since over on this. And I was like 14 years old, but there is a picture of me with a shotgun. I was 13 and there's a pile of doves in front of me that I don't know if we would have got a fine for thousands of dollars or thrown in the, in the clink for a while. It was just me and my uncle. And there was enough doves there that it was a lot. I'll just say there was a lot. And, and we didn't do that because we were like, hey, you know, let's go out and break the law or whatever. It was like, this is a really lean year, and there's a lot of doves today. We shoot a limit, they kind of disappeared, and shoot another limit, and they would kind of disappear. And shoot another limit, and they would kind of disappear. And I'm not endorsing that. I'm just saying that, you know, we didn't shoot more than our limited day for the season by the time it was all over with. But there was a... There was a certain level of, we kind of need to do this this year. We used to do other things, too, that were like not in the spirit of law, I guess. Back then, you got one deer tag on a license in Pennsylvania. Today, I think you can shoot up to like five deer up there. I know you can do it here in Texas. Uh, and there's ways down here to shoot deer and not even have to use your tag completely legally. Some of these places, they have such a huge population of deer, they get conservation tags. One of the places I hunt does this. So you go down there. Uh, last time I went, I shot two doe. I didn't take a single tag off my license. I didn't break the law at all or even the spirit of the law. Uh, they had conservation tags that I was using. So that deer was tagged, but not off my license. Uh, but back then it was one deer on a, on a hunting license. You got one deer, one turkey. Actually, you got one turkey spring and one turkey fall. And you got one goose for the whole season. And so when it came to deer, that was, you know, you put a deer in the freezer, you've done something. And especially a Northeastern deer, you know, a, a good mature doe will be 150 pounds dressed. A good mature buck will be over 200 pounds dressed out. So a deer was a huge resource. So families would do things like girl turns 12, she can go hunting and get a license now. I don't want to go. Okay, fine. You know what? Your ass is still going to hunter safety course and they'd go to hunter safety and you're going to pass and they would pass. And then she would be woken up in the morning, go with dad and brother and uncle in the truck. Truck could stay on idle, sleep in the back of the truck. And one of the guys would shoot a deer and then one would stand there taking their time, gutting it, feel the way go get the girl, the girl come back. Look, honey, you got a deer. I did. Yeah, you did. Let's get your license. Deer tag on. That deer would go home and be tagged on her tag. 
So we bought a license because that was something you didn't want to fool around with. And everybody knew that this was done. And it, there was just enough bad hunters versus the people that actually knew how to hunt that it never really hurt the deer population. But we, we did this again. It wasn't like, let's go see what we can get away with. It was that if we put an extra two deer in the freezer this fall, we're good. And it missed the point that we would have, a, you know, one deer a year pretty much made jerky. One deer a year pretty much made sausage. A couple deer were cut up mostly in the ground meat, uh, chops and steaks and roasts. And we did that every year. And it was, again, we enjoyed hunting. We enjoyed the community. We enjoyed the camaraderie. We absolutely did not do it just for recreation, though. I would say, you know, we went bear hunting every year. Very few bears were shot in the years that I hunted there, uh, as far as me and my own. If you got a bear, it was me. But it was a, let's get the hell out of here and go do dude things in the woods. It was a vacation. It was purely for recreation. Because the odds you were going to get one were pretty low. It was also the three days before Thanksgiving every year. So, you know, the adults would take off, kid get out of school. You'd, you'd, you'd have that weekend leading up to it. And then you'd have the holiday after it. So it became this way to end up taking 10 days off. And you know what Monday was after Thanksgiving? First day of buck season. And school was closed. And I think they still closed school on the first day of buck season up there. That's how ingrained this, this, this was. But I really encourage you to look beyond the deer. There's a lot of people, there's no place for me to hunt. Now, here in Texas, there's lots of deer, lots of hunting, very little free public access. There's all leases, paid hunts, and things like that. But what you can find is a lot of people will let you shoot squirrels, rabbits, whatever, for free. There's tons of things like that available. Waterfowl hunting in Texas is extremely accessible. And I think the limit on geese now is something like five a day. Five geese is a pretty good load of meat back into the freezer. So look, if you're going to hunt, look beyond the deer and the elk and the bear and understand that, again, it's a lot like the fishing I used to do. Over time, this adds up to significant protein yield. The overlooked opportunity with hunting and foraging, though, is Two things, locally accessible resources that you can sell in your community, like I talked about with the mushrooms, or outside of your community in some ways, and then local resources for your homestead. So let's look at this two ways. Behind me, you can't see it. I have a beautiful 55-gallon tropical fish planted aquarium. The centerpiece of it is a gorgeous piece of wood called Manzanito. It's, it's beautiful. And I have an aquarium store that I go to because this is my hobby. I don't make money on this. This is my, I just like to do it. And I like to sit here and look at these beautiful Australian rainbow fish cruising around in this tank I'm talking about. And if I went to my aquarium store and if he had had a piece of Manzanito like this, it would probably have cost me about 200 bucks. I, I'm, I mean, I'm serious. And people will pay for it. I won't pay that much for it, but people will pay for it. Well, I found a dude that sells it on eBay. And I think I paid 65 bucks for it. And I sent I, you know, I bought it. It showed up. I gave him a good review because it was shipped nicely. It was packaged well and all. And I reached out to him after he sent it to me. And I'm like, where do you get this stuff? And he, he lives in a part of California, near the desert, where this, like Desert Edge, where this tree traditionally grows. And he just walks around the desert and looks for nice pieces like that and some other stuff that he collects to sell to the pet and aquarium trade and collects this stuff, takes really, bought a nice light box and all, learned to do good photography. And he takes pictures of this stuff and sells it on eBay and Etsy and stuff like that. And from what I got out of him, I think he makes a significant portion of his income from just doing that. Now, anybody could do that that lives in that area, but there's probably not many people doing that. So you do need to look around and ask yourself, hey, what problem can I turn into a solution? When I first started growing certain plants that I will not name that you're not supposed to grow, um, 
because they're invasive and they're not invasive where I live or I would just go get them. Right. So, but, but, you know, Pete, what happens is states make laws based on an entire state and treat the climate of Dallas Fort Worth like it's the climate of Corpus Christi where these things can be a problem. And I, I went to eBay and it turns out people sell that. And you know where all the people live that sell it, that are selling it, not as licensed nurseries that this kind of gray market sell it. Florida, do you know why? Because when somebody orders, let's say, uh, 20 water hyacinth plants, the dude just walks down his backyard to the canal and pulls a bunch out, puts them in a bag and sends them. It's illegal. No one cares, though. I'm not saying to do anything illegal. I'm just telling you what these people are doing. And I think it's, it's wise to figure out if there's a way you can do it with low risk, if it's some, especially if you need income and it could be that easy. I really do. Now, I want you to be careful about some stuff. Uh, Dream Country Agriforce said, I just looked for elk steak. Found it for just under $50 a pound. Let me tell you what I'm not saying, because this can get you in deep shit, you know, in a, in a myriad of ways. I'm Because this is, I don't know a state where it would be legal to do what I'm about to tell you. Going out and hunting, shooting a deer and selling the meat. Or going out and catching a bunch of trout and then selling the trout. Uh, most states with hunting, that is a no-go. When you see venison for sale, it's probably European red stag grown on a farm. When you see elk for sale, it's probably European red stag or North American elk grown on a farm or a ranch. When it comes to fishing, if you're going to do that, and there is ways to make money freshwater fishing, states will have a commercial fishing license. And it's actually very affordable and I know at least one person that makes a decent living commercially fishing catfish using trot lines in Texas. So that's 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 another option, but it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking more like the gentleman that was making money off the Manzanito. It's little things that ship easily that are high dollar items like something like that or a plant that maybe is endemic to your area. Doesn't even necessarily happen to be something that uh, that they don't want you to sell, but it's not in other areas where people want it. And that could even be produced out of your own backyard as well. But definitely look at that. The other thing I said is resources that you can bring back and use on your homestead. This would include things like plants that do really well in the wild. Maybe just dig those up and you bring them home because even though I said what I did about my grandfather's view of blueberries, if I would to, if I were to take over, I don't, I wouldn't want my dad's house at this point. He's trying to sell it. Honestly, he'd been in that family for 120 years and he's trying to find a new place and, and move out. It's ready to fall apart now. Um, but my great uncle's place, one house up beautiful. If I bought that house or inherited that house today, uh, I would plant blueberries there because I know how well they do. There's a convenience thing. But I probably wouldn't buy them. I'd probably go up on a place called Pine Hill where we used to, to pick these berries. And I would probably dig up. And I know right where I'd go where the biggest ones grow. And I would bring them back to my property and I would plant them there. My dad did this for landscaping when I was a kid. The house that we had, not the one my grandparents and, and he lives in now. Uh, grandparents are long gone, by the way. Um, but we bought this brand new house. There was zero landscaping done to it. And everybody was paying money for bushes, and he thought that was stupid. He went up on the mountain, dug up some buck laurel bushes, brought them home, planted them, pruned them, and they looked beautiful. So you got to think about stuff like that. When I lived in Arkansas, I would do this off my own property and other properties. When we did our hoover culture stuff up there, I went and just picked up rotted, broken down, fallen limbs from everywhere, which meant it was just covered with all kinds of amazing fungus. Whenever I started a garden up there, I would go into the woods, I'd pull some leaves back, and I'd fill up a couple buckets of fluffy, duffy forest soil and bring that. And then I wouldn't fill a garden bed with that. I would just coat the surface before I mulch to infuse all that into it. And so you got to start thinking, what is it that's a value around me that I can bring to my property? I also, when I was a kid, my grandparents' place, 
they had gardens and stuff like that. And when I would go out, if I would catch, you know, green lizards and gnolls, uh, fence lizards and stuff like that, I would always bring them back to the property. And pretty soon we had a gazillion lizards running around. So some of this stuff, again, might be on the gray side of the law. You may or may not know it. I don't know if that was okay or not when I was a kid. I really don't know. But I know as a kid, I didn't even think about it. It was just like, oh, there's a lizard. and Put it in my pocket and bring it home and let it go. My, my grandparents' place in Pennsylvania, whenever I'd be out beating around a place we'd call the Monkey Ground or the Whimsy, which was an old stone, stone quarry us kids used to swim in, if we found box turtles, we'd bring them home and let them go on the property and just increase that diversity. I did it because I thought it was cool, but I realize now – I was actually increasing the wildlife presence and diversity on the property. I would do the same thing with like ribbon snakes and garter snakes. I would bring them back to the property. Black snakes, uh, black rats, because the black racers were assholes. They'd bite the shit out of you. But the black rat snakes were pretty easy to subdue, and I'd bring those home. And my grandfather would be like, that's great. They'll eat the rats, you know. It, it, it was just a different way of thinking. And so – I don't even know what you might be able to bring back, but that's something to look at. What can you actually turn into an on-site resource from off-site resources? Moving on to local barter. I think the biggest reason people fail to develop these parallel economies is they're the person who drills a well, who wants water to come out of the well, but they won't prime the pump. Here's what I mean by that. Now, today, I know we have self-priming pumps. Let's go back in time. Let's go back in time to when we didn't have a self-priming pump. You dug a well, you put a pipe down it, and you put a pump. You had to sit there like this with your arm and pump it. And if you did that, you could get well down into the water table. You could pump your ass off, and no water would ever come out of that pump. So what you did is you filled up a couple buckets full of water. You poured it down the pipe to the top of the pipe and you put the pump back on it and then when when you did when you did that I'll, I'll explain to you what that noise was next week it's it's something that's coming as a product i need to turn that off anyway um then you could get all the water you wanted and so the, the thing with barter and trade is people go out with this idea of who can i buy from and who can i sell to and you know you find that people generally aren't big on being sold to initially. So what's the pump priming when it comes to developing local economies? And it is you share. So if you give some stuff away, people will come back around and go, that was pretty cool. Do you have any more? And you say, well, I can't just give it all away. And a lot of times, like, well, what do you want for it? Well, now we're talking. Right. Or a lot of times what will happen is you share something and then someone will come offer to buy it. Or you share something and people will come back with, well, you gave it to me and I understand that and thank you, but let me do something for you. This is the foundation of, of, of markets is reciprocity. When you buy something you generally feel that you're getting at least as much as you gave or you wouldn't do it. Now, you may be getting it in direct or indirect value, right? Like if you buy a concert ticket and you go to a concert, once you go to the concert, there's no value except your memories. So it's a subjective value. Now, you might be scalping it or something, but assuming you're not, you're buying it more on your own subjective value. If you buy a tool, you're looking at that tool and going, What's the value of the tool across time? In most instances, if you're making a good purchase, a tool is always worth more than you pay for it. If you say, what would it cost for a mechanic to do this job that I could do if I had this tool? Once you do that job two or three times, that tool paid for itself 10 times. So it, it's all, that's always the case. That's always the, the calculation that people are making. A lot of people join MSB, my member support brigade, uh, uh, membership. And if you look at it purely economically, then if you pay $50 a year and you save 200, you made a good decision. But there's people that are like, if I need something, I'll check, but I don't even really think about it. I just think your show's worth 50 bucks a year. That's a subjective value. But still a person feels they're getting more than they're paying 
they feel some obligation or some desire for reciprocity. And if we would just do more giving, we'd get more in return. And it's the place to start. You know what's interesting? Joel Salatin has a book called Pastured Poultry Profits. If you want to start farming for money, especially animal farming for money, it is the book to buy. And his formula is you get 50, 100 meat birds. You learn how to, 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 to raise them. You process them. And you give half of them away. Four or five birds a piece to everybody that you know that would want them. And then you take orders for your next run. So if you don't believe me, believe Joel Salatin. And it's the same formula. And trust me, we came to it from entirely different uh, places, though that is also the Northeast United States. So share first, trade second, and it's amazing what happens. Next, when you need help, remember what I was talking about, like John Slifko at the little auto shop or whatever? I didn't go to Meineke. When I had a transmission problem, I didn't go to Amco. Right? When I needed tires, I didn't go to Firestone. Right? I went to somebody I knew. When I need work done at my house here, great big Metroplex, Dallas, Fort Worth, companies everywhere, turn the radio on. Anything you need done on a property, you will hear an advertisement for on talk radio within an hour or two from some big corporation. If I can do business with a local handyman, that's who I want to do business with. And when he's here doing his work, I want to talk to him. I want him looking for what else he can do to help me because that's good for him. I also want to talk to him. I want him understanding what I do because he's going to go talk to 20, 30 people this month. You see how that works? So just by using individuals, and I'm not saying if they have a – because if you're smart – and you're doing business over a certain amount of time, once you get a certain size, you create a company. My, uh, It's interesting because Drag Life is, uh, is talking to Hunter right now on, uh, on Twitch. I see in the chat there. I've got him up on the screen. I have an electrician. His name is Hunter. And I know him on a first-name basis. He has a company. He has, I think he has two employees now. But I'm doing business with him. And that means if I need some electrical work done, when I when I tell Dorothy we need something done, I'm like, call Hunter. Not, not, not oh, Hunter's in H, HVAC. That's interesting, too. Different Hunter. Well, if I need some HVAC work, dude, I know you're on the other side of the Metroplex, but maybe I'll call you. So I have, it's a different Hunter, Hunter. Um, you know, I say call Hunter, and Hunter comes and does our electrical work. And because of that, we don't deal with, well, I can get to you next Thursday. When we call him, if he's already on something or some sort of emergency, he'll tell us. But in general, it's like, how fast do you need? He'll ask, is this something really important? It might be, or it might be like, nah, man. We And he will schedule us according to our needs. But he's also a person that I promise you, I promise you I can... I can reach out to whatever I need beyond what he does. Let me see if I can turn that damn thing off. It's my wife sending pictures to a photo frame. It's going to be cool when I tell you guys about it next week. All right. Moving on from there, because that was a distraction, wasn't it? Um, identify key influencers in your community. This is where I'm going to bust off the Buddy Shoemaker stories again. So Buddy Shoemaker was this, this, this dude, this older gentleman, probably 15, 20 years younger than my grandfather. And he made wine. If you've ever heard the song by it was it David Lee Murphy, Dust on the Bottle, he was that dude, except I think that dude, Cleo Wilson, right? Uh, Cleo Williams, right? He lived in the South. Buddy, Buddy Shoemaker was the Cleo Williams of the North. This dude made wine out of everything. Dandelion wine, parsley wine. Carrot wine, actually good, shit you not. Grape wine, strawberry wine, blackberry wine, blueberry wine. This dude made sake out of freaking rice. You gave the man something, he'd figure out how to make wine out of it. And his shtick was pretty good. He never, and I mean he never, I don't think made wine with anything he had to pay for, grow, or collect. Because everybody knew, you take Buddy Shoemaker this stuff, he'll make wine out of it. And the way it worked is he would generally give you about half the wine he made from what you gave him. And he was supplying, you know, the extra sugar, 
and the yeast and the know-how and the equipment. And there was a certain time of year he made the rice wine, the sake. And I think he did that for himself, and he kind of gave that away. I think it's the one thing he actually bought that was an input because it had this really funky smell when you went by his place. And he had that going. But the other thing he was, he was a community influencer. And so we, we use that word today, and we're talking about some moron that ate a Tide Pod on Instagram reels or something, right? And has a bunch of likes or some idiot that put a firecracker in his ass. I don't know. This was actually a real legitimate influencer within the community. And what I meant by that is when I mentioned this guy that helped me with my transmission and with my exhaust system named Andy, my dad knew him. Had my father not known that man, and I'd went up and he knew me, I used to bring him two hefty sacks of my grandfather's grapes every year. I'd haul up there. I'd take two trips before I had a car because one was too heavy to carry two, right? And But if I'd gone up there and said, Mr. Shoemaker, I have a problem with my car. I was wondering if you knew somebody who could help me. Now, I don't know if I would have ended up with the same person, but I know he would have said yes. I know he would have made a phone call or two at the most. And I know whoever he talked to would said, send that kid over. I got it. And when you start identifying community influencers like that, you end up realizing that most people think they live in kind of this isolation where there's not a lot of people like them around. There's more people like us than there's not. We just don't know each other anymore. And so definitely try to find those influencers, but don't, it, this is a, this is a tricky thing today. You just kind of knew the influencers because they were influencing you back then. So you can't go into relationships now with what can I get out of it? You always need to lead with what can I do for you? And I don't mean in kind of a, a you know, a, a devil way, like I'll do you a favor and you do me a favor, a mafia way, like I'll do you a favor, you do me a favor. I just mean, Get out about and meet people and realize when you're talking to somebody that is an influencer, they're going to sound humble and they're not going to sound like it at first. That, that, that person who just seems genuinely helpful is the person that you want to be friends with, not for what they can do for you, because that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that uh, <laughs> that's the kind of there's just a funny thing being said in the uh, comments right now. That's the kind of person you want to be friends with anyway. Like one of my rules for friendship, and when I say friendship, I don't mean that I like you. I mean that we're going to hang out. You have to be a person that when I look at the totality of who and what you are, this is kind of life advice here outside of the what we're talking about today. There has to be something about you that I look at and go, I want to be better at that. I'm not saying you have to be better than me to be my friend, because if I was saying that, then all my friends, I would be worse than. And they would be breaking the advice that I'm giving you. What I'm saying is well, that person's a better networker than me. That person's better at relationships than I am. That person's better at managing money or raising kids or uh, taking care of themselves or taking care of their, you know, th there's just something that I said I'd like to be a little bit more like that person. And so that's the kind of people you want to build your friendships, your relationships, and your networks with anyway. You're going to find if you do that, a certain percentage of them are going to be influencers. Where if you if you don't practice that, I don't even like the way this sounds, but, but method of, of, of discouraging relationships then what's going to happen is, number one, since you become more like the people you're around, they're going to pull you down instead of challenge you to come up. Man, that just won't go away. <laughs> um, I, I, give me just a minute, folks. I'm going to have to message my wife. I'll have to edit out that long pause there. Anyway, um, where was I? That is distracting as heck. I can't believe how loud that thing is. Um, those are the people that you want to be around, the relationships that you want to have. And if you don't, you get drugged down and you're not challenged to drag them up. If you 
if you kind of look at the people that you spend your time with and you can say, here's the, the five people that I spend the most amount of time with in my life. And if you sat down with a piece of paper right now, could you list two, one or two or three things about them that you wish you were better at? Then you'll probably find that your life is in a constant trajectory upward. And if you can't, then you'll find that your life is in a constant trajectory downward. And so I'm not saying you can't be friendly with people like that. I'm just saying you don't want to spend your time with them. So if you're doing that anyway, you're going to find the influencers in your community, assuming you're getting into your community, you're spending time with your community. Next, get involved with local events and things like that, because if you do that, you're going to meet more people. You're going to get more opportunity to do all the things I just said. But let me tell you a place that's generally not good for this. I'm not saying it's always bad, but I, I've never met a friend that I still have at a chamber of commerce thing. It's all a bunch of wheeling and dealing and, and, and internal politics and stuff like that uh, at those things in general. I, and I know somebody's going to email me. Go, I'm at best friend of my life. I, I, yeah. Cause people go there and some people are cool, but I mean, I was deeply involved with the rich Richland uh, Richardson chamber of commerce back when tech was huge in Dallas long before TSP I was on their technology business council and stuff like that. I had a huge Rolodex of people that I could reach out to, and I could get all kinds of business things done, but I had no real connection to those people. I certainly wasn't practicing what I was just preaching with going, well, this guy, Bill Williams, what, do, what does he have that I want to be more like? And it was like, Bill Williams has a staffing or a, a, a customer service corporation that he runs and we are a placement agency and I want to put CSRs to work. At. That's what that was. And, and that mindset's kind of there. They're there to do business. But what else is there in your area? And if there's nothing, maybe you need to start some stuff up. I think one of the best things that people can do is create meetups or events around things that aren't what we're talking about, but are in the same place. So be like, I want a prepper group. Yeah, put up, I want a prepper group on on, uh, on Meetup, and probably the people that are going to come are going to be um, feds, wannabe feds, and freaks, right? But if you say we're doing a viewing of Jeff Lawton's Urban Permaculture at the community center Thursday night, you know, uh, bring your own, bring chips and stuff like a kind of like a like a potluck, but it's just a snacks potluck or something. You're probably going to get, you know, if you use next door and things like that, 10, 15 people show up. You all have a common ideology where we started this and then you see where that goes. And if you make a friend or two and that grows great, if you don't, you had an interesting evening. It was no real cost. And you keep doing stuff like that until you find out what works. That's another way to kind of expand your contact. So you, you have your contact rate. How many people do you meet a year that you didn't know before? And then of that number of people, how many of them are people that you want to have more of, a, of, a, of an ongoing relationship with? And when I say that, I realize that often sounds like in our mindset today, a relationship, well, that's romantic. No, I mean, I'm like, I've got lots of friends. We have a friendly relationship, right? So if you're single, maybe you find that too, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I want to also give you kind of some steps because that's kind of your steps to, to start getting the, 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 the local trade knowledge and barter and community and connection thing going. What about foraging, hunting, and fishing? If you're sitting here going, I'd love to do that, but I don't know any place to go. One is start to identify as many opportunity spots as you can find. If you have contacts, ask. Yeah, I was surprised one day I went on next door around here and said, hey, I like to fish. And, and I'm, I don't, I'm not really a boat fisherman. I like to fish from a bank. I like small bodies of water, half an acre, two acres, stuff like that, where I can catch bluegills and catfish. I got a list of places. There's a pond behind this church. As long as you keep everything clean, they don't care if you fish there. There's this old band. I mean, like this list of places to go. I was blown away because people generally are kind of uh, secretive with their, their honey hole fishing spots. But what I found out is that most of the people offering this information, they didn't actually fish these spots. They just 
with that many eyeballs on it, there's people drive around every day and I see people fishing there. And a lot of people are kind of nosy in a, in a friendly way where they'll stop and they'll just say, Hey, do you ever catch? Not because they want to fish there too. They're just curious. You ever catch anything or yeah, what do you catch? So then they, they knew these locations and they just spit it all out. So that's one way you can find you ask people, you know, you ask people you don't know through local networking, use technology. But another way, like for fishing, especially get on Google Maps, start looking around you, make a list, go scout the location, scout these, call these opportunity locations. The problem is when people do this, they're looking for a guarantee. There's no guarantees. So this is hunting, fishing, foraging, all of it. Find places that look like they might work and go there and keep notes. Because one of the things you need to remember is that you might go to a place and you're like, this is a cool place and it might be a nice place to take a walk, but there ain't hill of beans of any resource for foraging here. Well, maybe it's a place that has blackberries, but it's September. Do you know how many wild blackberries you find in September? None. None. Now, maybe in the Southern Hemisphere. So Northern Hem, and I, I don't even know, right? Uh, but the... the where I live, you're not finding blackberries in September. So that place might be one to come back and check that time of year. You might need to learn what a blackberry plant looks like without a blackberry on it. So that you can be like, hey, there's blackberries at this location. And then you kind of know when your, your ripening season is and check them. When you're at these places, if they're like public parks or something where other people are, just talk to people randomly. Hey, how you doing? You know, and if they're people that are like, I don't like strangers, don't walk away. Don't be afraid to talk to people, though. And, and there's different areas where different people have different philosophies about this. Where I grew up, I always took it as like everybody's friendly with each other. And I never realized as a kid, it was because everybody knew each other. So I remember a friend of mine from there came down to visit me. And I was at the grocery store. Is well, we're going to get one of our snowstorms in Texas. That means that, like, we're going to get a dusting. Well, what's everybody do? Run to the grocery store, get bread and bread and milk, right? And so I, I didn't want to go to the grocery store because I knew it was going to be like that. I knew it was going to be like that, but I had to for some other shit my wife made me go get because we had company in. And my friend was with me. And... I mean, the lines are like into the aisles and Texans are pretty switched on folks generally with stuff like this. So basically we're leaving a gap so people can get by. And so we're back in the aisle behind the gap at this point. And there's a lady in front of me and I made a comment about something. And she turned around and we started talking. Turned out her husband was a, was a, a preacher at a local church. And we were talking about that. And when he was in seminary school and we just sat there and shot the shit for a good 10 minutes Till she finally got up to buy her bread and milk and get out. And I bought the stuff my wife made me go get. And my buddy Tim, after she leaves, says, well, how do you know her? And I said, I don't. I don't even know what her name is. And he goes, I can't believe you had a conversation like that with somebody you don't even know. And he was from where I grew up where I felt like everybody was that way. So you have to adapt that. But don't be afraid to talk to people. Um, you will occasionally make the mistake. Right. You talk to somebody that won't stop talking and they attach to you like some kind of alien sucker face or something. Uh, and you have to get away. I've had that happen. I did that one time in line at the DMV. That sucked because I wasn't going to get out of line. Uh, so there's always risk with everything. But talk to people um, and, and you might learn something about a place that you're at. Or you might actually like, you know, I'm looking for places to fish. That, like I've had places. Here's a perfect example. I found this park on google maps that had a creek going through it and the creek was like on the outside of the park and but when you got to the creek it was huge thick brush and it was like a straight drop down there was no good access and so i'm walking around the outside of this athletic field and this lady was looking for her dog who had hauled ass and the dog came running down by me and i grabbed the dog and gave it back to her and i kept looking in the woods and finally she's like what are you looking for and I said, I, I, I want to fish this creek, and I, I don't have any fishing stuff with me, you know, so I made that look a little weird at first. And, and, and I'm like, but I, I'm looking for a place where you can get access to it. She said, oh, you don't want to fish here. It's, it sucks here. You can't get down there. 
And she looks down, and she's right. She's like, if you get down, you're probably going to get up. I'm like, yeah. She goes, if you go down the road about a mile and make a left, the same creek, there's a bridge that crosses there, and I see people fishing there all the time. Well, thank you. And it turned out you could go down there, and you could follow this other road by it, and you could get in the creek and walk down to the spot that I really wanted to fish behind the park. And I probably would have figured that out anyway, but without that lady telling me that, I wouldn't have known. So definitely try to talk to people. And again, keep a journal on what you find. Um, also, remember my uncle's rule about parks, state game lands, any kind of place that has public access. 90% of the people will only step on 10% of the property. So try to expand your search into the retina. Now, don't go get lost or nothing. This is where GPSs are worth their weight in gold, et cetera. Um, pay attention to where you're going. Don't get stuck after dark. But get outside of the paths and the spaces that everybody stays on because that's where you're going to find things that, you know, people don't even know that they're looking for. And if they do know they're looking for them, then you really need to get off of that. But keep really good records, especially with fishing. With fishing, it behooves you to get some way to take the temperature of the water. And when you go fishing, good, bad, or indifferent, what you caught, what you used for bait, what you observed, what the weather was like, what the temperature was like while you were there that morning, and what the overnight low is going to be. Okay. And what the overnight low was preceding it, and the water temperature. Now, people will be like, what surface temperature at two? I don't care how you take the water temperature, except if it's super shallow and the sun's beating on it in the middle of summer, take it somewhere, but always do it the same way. Because it won't for that location, it won't matter that when the surface temperature is 78 degrees, that five feet deep, it, it's 67 degrees. It won't matter. If you always take it the same place, then the conditions will be similar. Was it windy? Was it calm? Was the wind from the east, the west, the south? Just a real basic snapshot of what things were like. Because what will happen inevitably is you'll get a weekend you can go fishing, and you got two spots that are close enough to go, and you look at the conditions, and you might have to estimate what the water temperature is, but you have all the rest of the information, and you're going to be like, didn't do good under these conditions in this place, did phenomenal in that place, even if the first place is the one that's generally better, guess where you're going, spot B. And the same thing with like when you find mushrooms, mushrooms reproduce under certain conditions, they drop spores, you find a mushroom honey hole, you want, I'm putting, at this point in my life, I'm putting down GPS coordinates when you find a good mushroom hole. Now, where I live, like I said, this is all geographically dependent. We don't find we don't find ourselves a lot of mushrooms here in Texas, right? We're not a heavy mushroom environment. We're dry and hot versus cool and wet. So I'm not saying you can't find mushrooms here. I'm saying they're not like they were in the Northeast woods. But if if I was living up there, I would have every I would have waypoints marked like I do for fishing spots on a lake and a GPS for mushrooms. Um, really good re records. Again, day, time, weather, temp, et cetera, especially with fishing. You know, my final thoughts on this, this all might sound a little bit overwhelming. It doesn't need to be. It's the old story, you know, how do you eat the elephant? You eat them one bite at a time and eventually eat the entire elephant. Break a piece of this off for yourself. You know, break a piece of this off for yourself. It's winter right now, not a lot of hunting. You know what? Growing up as a kid, this is when we did our heaviest scouting for deer season. And we did it for, for a big reason up there. You had a lot of times the snow was down. That shows you tracks. You, the deer doesn't walk through snow and not leave tracks. or no levitating deer yet or anything like that. But you'd find sheds. you find a big antler shed. That buck made it through hunting season. He's still out there, and he's going to be bigger next year. But even if it didn't have snow down or you didn't find sheds, the woods were open, and you could identify things like 
bedding locations that maybe those deer weren't even using now, right? So the deer would tend to move more to bedding in the pine, uh, the pine thickets in this late part of the year when it's cold and wind and all, but they didn't necessarily bed there at the time of year that you'd be hunting them in the fall or the early winter. And you would be able to locate where these deer were bedding and where they were traveling, what their interconnections were. And you'd often, often also be able to find, you know, old scrapes and rubs from that season before that you would have missed otherwise when everything was thick. Or you'd be able to determine there was a pattern the deer were following. And now that everything's opened up a lot more, when the hunting pressure came in, how did they alter their pattern? Where was their... Where was their thick stuff that they were hiding in and how were they getting there? So that's just one example. You might come up with a totally different example of what advantage you have by doing your scouting, let's say in winter, when the thing you want to do is actually spring. Less people there, more people there. I don't know. But make sure that you don't use the excuse of, well, it's not time for that. It's always time for something. And I I'm going to tell you that the the reality is that I don't even like to leave my house anymore. It's a good thing I only have three acres and no pond. I, I would probably be a hermit by now. If I had 20 acres and, a, and a two or three acres of water divided up against five or six ponds, I don't know if you'd get me out of here, right? I, I, I really don't know that you would ever get me out of here. Uh, anyway, Moving on from there, I just want to do a few questions I have starred here from people. Uh, Varmouth 3115 says, do you have any episodes on cooking for beginners? I don't know if I ever did one specifically for beginners, but none of my cooking episodes are highly advanced. I would say go to the survivalpodcast.com, get the search bar, stick cooking in there, and you'll find all the cooking episodes and cooking products I recommend, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll do that this month, right? Why not an episode on, I don't know how to cook shit. I can microwave noodles of oodles and I want to get started and become a good cook. That's not a bad idea. We already covered Snell Creek's comments on frogs and turtles. Other than I'll say again, you are right, buddy. Frog is some good stuff. Turtle, it's good. It's a lot of work for what you get. That's that, that that's my opinion. Snell Creek also says community not working until life gets harder. I know what you mean, and I want to agree, but I don't. And the reason I say that is because there's community working right now all around you. You're just not part of it. And that's a big part of what I was talking about today. So hopefully that'll make sense. One Step Closer says... It's great to have a guy, even better to have someone's guy for something. And, and what one step means is when you have somebody that when you have a problem or an issue, you immediately know, call that. If I need electrical work, I'm calling Hunter. If I need basic, I had a guy named Dave, Dave Myers. If I need some basic handyman work done, I'm calling Dave Myers. My son's best friend is a general contractor. So if I need something at a higher level done, I'm calling my son and saying, hey, tell Casey to get in touch with me when he has time. It, it is outstanding to have that, to know the person to call or the person to call when you don't know who to call, that you know will know who to call. And 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 that's that's the people, you, you know, we used to say in sales, you want those people in your Rolodex. Walt says, how do you tell between buck beds and others? This is a big, it depends. Um, if you have a bedding area and there's like a line of, of, of rubs that lead out of it and back to it, it's probably an area a buck or group of bucks were using. In Pennsylvania, back when I was a kid, our buck doe ratio was crazy off. There was a, so many does because there was such an emphasis on don't kill the does, only kill the bucks. And we had really scrubby little bucks and a few big ones, right? And because anything with a horn on its head over three inches on one side was instantly killed. And it was just the way that the game regulations were set up. And so I don't know, you know, what it's like today. But what I'll tell you is when I was a little kid, and I, you know, teens, 
And I would see these shows of guys like hunting in Texas or whatever, and there'd be this field and there was like 12 buck together with no does in this field. I would be like, that's fake as shit. That's got to be like a, like a ranch where they feed them. There's no way that that it, it, it you know, you, you move to Texas and we take rides through like this nature center down here stuff. And there's, there's no high fences or shit like that. There's, you know, five bucks walking together, hanging out. It just, it is the case because they don't have the imbalance in the herd. So the bucks will get together in these bachelor groups. So how's that work out as it depends on, on betting. When you found an area that was used as a bedding area, and you could tell it was used by like a deer where I grew up, it was a buck. If it was used by a shitload of deer, it was a group of does. If you did that down here, no guarantees on that at all. What you would be more suited to do is to find bedding areas and then understand this, where there are deer, there are both kinds of deer. And so in hunting season, we're generally around the rut. What is a buck looking for? He looking for does. Or you, you zoom in on the area and then you start scouting the deer and then you pick individual bucks to target into better patterns. So that, that's better than just saying this is a buck uh, bed or not. Now, I will tell you this is not 100%, but when you have deer, where they have their hooves and what we call hawk claws, the, the backside of the hoof, a, a buck deer will generally make deeper in the same material, uh, deeper hawk claw prints behind the front paws. So that's something you can look for too. But just because you see that doesn't mean it's a buck. Uh, Joe says security cover and wind direction, good advice, but I don't know that that's going to, and I think he's answering Walt there. I don't know that will definitely pin you down to a buck, but, and again, they were hunted harder, but it was generally the bucks that had a little bit more savvy to their pattern where the does were more just leading their fawns back and forth. If you were in an area that had woods and cornfields, those does would just go back and forth every freaking night. All right. With that, guys, I had a great time today. I want to remind you, if you like this show and the work that we do, there's a few ways that you can help support this show. One uh, is do your online shopping at tspaz.com. My uh, item of the day for you today, I've been bringing to you for four years now. General Hydroponics Rapid Rooter Grow Plugs. Uh, I love these things. If you look, if you're on the video, these are some tomato plants that I didn't, I didn't even grow with them. I, I made starts with them. And those are 20 something odd day old tomato plants that were transplanted out into my garden. And you can look at them and they have freaking stems on them as big around as my thumb uh, and roots that are freaking eight, 10 inches long. And so they were fantastic for that. They were also just really great uh, overall in general for growing. I have a whole write up on them. Uh, they can seem expensive. They're about 37 cents a pop when you buy a bag of 50 of them right now. I don't consider them expensive at all because I use them about four to five times before they crap out. Uh, when I'm done growing, and this is for not enough, I'm stewing starts, they get planted in the ground. It's pretty much gone. Uh, they'll disintegrate by the end of the season. But for, for stuff you're growing out, when I pull that lettuce plant out, it's finally done its deal. I cut the top of it off, throw that in the compost, and I throw the rapid rooter plug on top of one of my ebb and flow beds, and the worms eat it. I have another friend named James who's part of the audience who helped me out a lot when I got started. He has a worm bed. He just throws his rooter plugs on top of his worm bed in a couple of days, and they're completely cleaned out. Uh, then I don't know what he does. What I do is I do about 20% hydrogen peroxide, 80% water, I soak them in it. I leave them in there for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, squeeze them out real good so they're damp, put them in a Ziploc bag and put them away and use them again. So, you know, then I'm getting my price down to, you know, four cents. I think that's, and, and yeah, whenever I bring these up, there's always people that are like, you know what, if you use rock wool or use, do what you want. The reason I recommend these so highly is they worked better for me and better for most people than anything else on an ongoing basis. They're more forgiving with the balance of pH and stuff like that. Another thing you can check out and just get one because they're cool, uh, but you can also support the show by doing this because it's my shop. 
You notice today I'm wearing my Redneck Hippie Duck Farmer t-shirt. So many of you guys said you wanted them. They're here now. Go get you one. This is the Dark Heather. Uh, they also come in uh, navy and, 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 and black. Uh, I like black mostly for my shirts, uh, but I personally think the Dark Heather in this design uh, looks best. And we also have a, a, a version where this design is on the back and there's a smaller, different design over the pocket. You can check that out. And all of this stuff is available at TSP Swag. We have hats. We have hoodies. We got stuff from the Bitcoin side of things as well. Uh, mugs and tumblers. It's all available at TSP Swag. Check out the coffee cup. I really like that. Check out the tumblers. Uh, all just great stuff. Next up, yesterday I had John Bush on, and he mentioned that you know he's running Greater Reset 4. It's the 18th through the 22nd, just a few weeks out. I'm going to be there speaking. John will be there. Uh, Texas Slim will be there. Lots of cool folks are going to be there. Zuby is going to be there performing Saturday evening. But guess who he just signed? If you're in the video, you know. You know. But if you don't, I mean, you have to wait. Jack, tell me. J.P. Sears from like Awaken with J.P., the really funny guy that did all the satire videos. Great comedian. A uh, little bit liberal in the beginning. Got his ass censored enough times that he kind of woke up. That, that really ain't the way to do things now, is it? Uh, he's going to be down there. Now, J.P.'s kind of like an online megastar. So is Zuby. Um, Mark Moss is going to be there. Tickets are like 300 bucks or something to come in person for all those days with lunches and never and get to meet people like that. It's pretty all aw- Texas slim, etc. Pretty freaking awesome. And then one more thing before we close up today. Uh, I don't know what the price went up to. Let's see if it'll tell me, but Paul Wheaton's homestead bundle is pretty awesome. I don't think it went up yet. I think the price is going to go up at midnight tonight uh, still 35 bucks for 35 resources, $285 worth of stuff. Link in the video notes and the show notes. Check those out. With that, guys, I had a blast today. I love talking about my time as a teenager. What I really hope, and this is just serious, what I really hope is that the work that I'm doing and I have been doing for 15 years now at the Survival Podcast will make enough people dig into what it truly is to be human, to learn homesteading skills, to learn foraging skills, to learn permaculture skills, to learn carpentry skills, learn you know basic hard skills like welding again, and reach out and, and do this with your fellow man. Start building community. Everybody wants a community. I want to do a prepper community. I want to do a permaculture community, an intentional community, whatever. You know, you have a community around you. You just don't know it. And I'm not saying like give up on the dream of building uh, a community like that, a planned community. If you want to do that, go for it. But there's so many people that talk about that that are never going to do it. They're waiting for somebody else to do it. And they don't realize that there's a guy down the road from them that are just like them. You know, if you think about it, when I do my on-site workshops and people come here, people come from all over the country. Sometimes we've had people come here from, I had one dude come here from Kenya. I had another dude come here from New Zealand. I've had people come here from Mexico. It's kind of humbling to have people make journeys like that to come hang out at your house and camp in your backyard for half a week, but I've had it. But the bigger point of that is all these people get together and they're like, wow, I'm not crazy. There's other people like me out there. Think about how many more people like us there really are. And until we start to do these things again, until we start to set up events for people to coalesce around, I mean, honestly, just ask yourself, if somebody set up uh, a viewing of a permaculture video, like Jeff, I think Jeff Lawton's Urban Permaculture is fantastic for this, right? And you saw it and you heard about it. If you could, it was like, we're going to sit here for two hours, watch the video for an hour and talk about it. And, and, and you bring the kids if they want to. There's play stuff on the other side of the community. Come out. Hang on. Would you, would you go? I think I might meet some cool people. But it's not there. Well, then you do it. Make it happen. Because what I want is I, I want someday – Long after I'm dead and gone and my grandkids are old, I want some 
somebody that's my age now to get on the line, to get online and do a podcast or a video and tell a story about the good old days back in the 20s, the 2020s. We're going to have to reestablish this ourselves. There's no running away. I know I tell you to get out of the cities, and I mean it, but what I'm saying when there's no running away, there's no, there's no Galt's Gulch. There's not going to be a Galt's Gulch. It's not going to If it does, it's going to be a virtual one where people start learning to do business online. And Bonnie Blue, thank you for the, the, the 1999 Super Chat. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. We have to do what we can with what we have. I know that sounds like a cliche. But there's some cliches that are there for a reason. There really are. They're, 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 there's something that we need to, to understand at a deeper level and, and, and know more about. And with that, I will say goodbye. And I'll be back tomorrow with an expert counsel Q&A show for the week. If you have something you'd like me to talk about on this show, remember, I'm incredibly accessible by email. I don't answer them all, but I do read them all. All you have to do is send me an email with jack at survivalpodcast.com. And in the subject line, include the letters TSPC. Do it like an acronym, like all capital letters, like it's a word. TSPC in the subject line. That way, if the spam monster eats it, I will be able to dig it out. Uh, I also want to, I keep forgetting to say this. Um, I'm doing a workshop next Saturday here on composting. And it's full and there's a waiting list. And the waiting list has like six people on it and two of them are couples. So if you email me about it now, um, I could put you on the wait list. That's the best that I can do. That filled up the day I released it, uh, which is really cool. But keep an eye open. I like doing the little, you know, half day Saturday work with Jack workshops. Uh, generally speaking, I charge 15 to 20 bucks for them. This one's 20 bucks. I take the money and I buy food for everybody. Uh, this time we're going to do brisket, black pepper, sausage, and, and ribs all from uh, uh, Dickie's Barbecue. Uh, so we'll just you know, call an order in advance and then my wife will go pick it up right before lunchtime. And so that's, that's what we, um, that's, that's, that's kind of what we do with these things. And I did quite a few of them a few years back and we kind of quit doing them. And I really need to kind of start doing those again, because they're a great way to do what I said. And it's, it's a very similar thing to what Nicole sauce does in her area with the get shit done weekends. And that's another thing y'all can do. I mean, not everybody has a podcast and can put 14 people in an event in half a day. I understand that. But there's ways to do it. Like, you know, run a little workshop on your property. Don't do it to get work done unless it's just the opportunity presents itself, right? Uh, and Joe, I think you're trying to say cap stick. I'm not sure who. Uh, Peter Hathaway cap uh, uh, uh uh, I'm sorry. I don't know who he's trying to talk with there, but Peter Hathaway Capstick is the author that I've recommended. I don't know who Dick Panay is, but that's not somebody that I've recommended. Uh, but yeah, do something like just something, you know, let's say all I've done, all I've done is set up a little hydroponic system, right? I just set up a little indoor hydroponic system that grows me four salads a week. You know, there might be some people that would want to know about that. Maybe you go on next door and say, I'm doing a workshop on Saturday, 15 bucks. You can emulate that. Anybody won't pay 15 bucks. It didn't come in anyway. And, and some pictures of it. And I'm going to show you exactly how to make this. And I'm going to use the 15 bucks to serve everybody lunch. And start building that local community. Because if we don't rebuild this local interaction, then when people like me die, these stories will die with us. I don't care that I'm going to die someday. I'm okay with that. I'm in touch with my mortality. When you're when you're 17 years old and ready to jump out of an airplane, you're already in touch with your mortality. I don't want this part of our culture to die when my generation goes. With that, I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Been Jack Spear with another episode of the Survival Podcast. <laughs>